thanks very much for that welcome. I feel really embarrassed, Dom, turning now to the, yet again, to the worst side of human behavior, just after such an eloquent um, uh, verbal essay about the best side of human behavior, because what I'm gonna speak about is about extremes of violence. And I want to apologize in advance for some of the material I'm gonna be dealing with, because surely um, sexual violence is the one of the worst kinds of human behavior. And I want to start with an interview that really got me obsessed. In fact, I still can't get it out of my head. It was an interview I read many, many years ago, just before I wrote A History of Rapists in the uh, British and American rapists in the 19th and 20th centuries. And in this interview, it was an interview of a man who had just come back from Vietnam. And he said something along the lines of, well, um, there was this occasion, this day, um, when we stood around and we raped this woman. And then he went on and he said, you know, we didn't care. He used a lot of swear words, which I'm, I'm going to admit. Um, he said, we didn't care what her name was. Um, all we cared about was that she was young and she was Vietnamese. And he described in, in great, great detail the way these armed men, we all stood around her. Um, he said, and we all uh, raped her in turn. We, he said we were like an animal pack um, with our rifles around this victim, this animal. Um, and we raped her, and then it was his turn. And he said, and I, I began. And then he said, and all of a sudden, she turned to me, and she said in English, she said, but why? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? And that, that story, I dedicate my book to her, this unnamed woman, that story still resonates with me. Because as John Emery said in um, his work, that torture, and in particular I would like to suggest sexual torture, is what most destroys thrust in the world. He went on to say that he was a torture victim himself, not sexual torture victim himself. He went on to say that, okay, so the physical agony that that unbelievable pain that you might experience does fade away. But the realization that not one person in that room was cared anything about your suffering, they were all completely impervious to your suffering, that, that pain never leaves you. In his words, whoever has succumbed to torture can never feel at home in the world. So I think rape reminds us that war is not simply mechanical slaughter. Um, the, the penis actually becomes a weapon. The man can seem primed to rape. Surely I would like to suggest that this is one of the worst of human nature. Um, but who is this human of perpetration? Um, a lot of work that we have um, suggests that this human um, is actually coded male. And the book that I, I, I just came out a few months ago, um, What It Means to Be Human, explores this in greater detail. The way when we often talk about human, we actually are talking about male human. And my favorite example of this is, of course, Desmond Morris, um, where he wrote, The Naked Ape, self-named Homo sapiens, is proud that he has the biggest brain of all the primates, but attempts to conceal the fact that he also has the biggest penis. Well, um, that sort of knocks me out of humanity, I'm afraid. Um, he went on, he, he kept digging out, digging his hole. He went on to argue something along the lines that women's orgasms were, his words, pseudo-male. They were simply imitations of male orgas orgasms. Um, What's interesting, um, well, firstly, this human is coded male, and those of us who sort of um, disagree with that are sometimes accused of political correctness. But what is really interesting when we start looking at certain forms of sexual violence is just how pervasive this notion is. Um, I think we all ought to remember that at least 11% of perpetrators of sexual violence are, in fact, women. So who is this this this? human that we're talking about, the perpetrator we're talking about. The pervasiveness of sexual violence in our society is something that we actually have become quite impervious to, and I think that was being suggested um, slightly um, earlier by, by Lisa. Um, that, um, I mean, literary romances are full of heroines who are being ravished against their will by the, you know, the glorious um, uh, hero of the piece. Films, one in every five, one in every five Hollywood films, movies, has a violent rape scene. 
This country, Britain, has one of the worst reputations in all of Europe for the way we treat rape victims. Um, Ireland is actually, is actually worse, by the way. Um, ICM poll, just actually a few years ago, a couple of years ago, showed that one third of women in this country, one third, one in three women, when polled, said that if another woman, I think they were excluding themselves, if another woman ha um, was being flirtatious and she was subsequently raped, that she was somehow responsible for what took place. One in three women, and of course, uh, many more uh, men um, um, agreed with that very, very important, very significant rape myth. There we go. Um, just actually, literally a week after the revelations of what was happening in Abu Ghraib came out, um, the sexual torture, general torture in Abu Ghraib came out, I was on the internet and there was this proliferation of images of people doing a lindy. And I'm not exaggerating, there are literally hundreds of photographs of people doing a lindy. So what is doing a Lindy? And I think this is a really another example of the way we treat rape in our country. Doing a Lindy has detailed instructions that you have to follow very, very carefully. Here are the instructions. First, find a victim who deserves to be Lindied. Make sure you have a friend nearby with a camera ready to capture the Lindy. Stick a cigarette or pen, with political correctness there again, stick a cigarette or pen in your mouth and allow it to hang slightly below the horizontal. There's lots in between there. And then tilt your upper body slightly forward, but lean back on your right leg. Make a hitchhiking gesture with your right hand. Point in the direction of the victim and smile. Um, you know, the sort of ultimate in sort of subjectivity, all powerful subjectivity, and smile. And there's literally hundreds of these images. Here's some here, um, a man with a drunk woman, a man with someone in a kitchen, a pregnant woman in the kitchen, um, some sort of um, uh, rape orgy there. And one of the ones I found most distressing is Teletubbies doing a Lindy. Um, surely this is one of the worst of human behavior. Um, Teletubbies doing a Lindy. It's easy to be deaf to the cries of the women who say to the victims, who say, well, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? And here I think it is the specificities that we need to look at, the specificities of history, of location, of identity, of, of character, of gender, that there's a lot of work being done in recent decades um, positing that sexual violence is somehow natural, is somehow inherent in mankind, and is somehow universal. I mean, any historian is able to tell you that in fact sexual violence is not universal, and over time we can see periods where it's extremely prevalent, and other times when in fact it's extremely low. So it's precisely these specificities of time, place, identity, history that we need to look at. And a lot of evolutionary psychology um, today suggests um, or argues quite explicitly that rape is a biological imperative, and that's a direct quote, a biological imperative. But of course, as we all know, there are lots of biological imperatives that are not political possibilities. A true interest, I would like to suggest, in violence lies less in the body or brain and more in that body as it moves in the world, as it moves through the world. There's interesting changes, though, in the way sexual violence has been narrated over time from the um, pre-1970s and post-1970s. And just as a shorthand, I'd like to suggest that there's been a shift from um, sexual violence, um, analyses of sexual violence, looking at causes and I'm going to use military examples here just for convenience, but I, the book looks at civilian causes of sexual violence carried out by British and American troops to the effects of sexual violence on those self-same perpetrators. So in other words, a shift from well, what caused our men to a rape in wartime to uh, what were the effects of um, them carrying out these acts of rape on those perpetrators. Um, so, for example, causes, the causes really proliferate. There are, there are so many of them. They go from racism, that's a big one, masculinity, peer pressure, fear of punishment, superior orders, environmental confusion, retaliation, revenge, lack of training, 
failures in military leadership. I mean, they go on and on so much that, in fact, you wonder, well, why isn't every serviceman you know, committing these, these acts of rape? I mean, they are so overdetermined. And of course, the servicemen themselves become passive in the face of all of these stresses. But since the 1970s, I mean, this has continued, but there's actually been a shift of an emphasis in a lot of work. And that is from looking at causes to looking at the effects on these self-same perpetrators. So, in other words, the invention of trauma or the application of trauma to um, servicemen who have committed these sorts of atrocities. And an important sort of um, turning point was in uh, 1980 with the third edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. It's sort of the Bible of psychiatry, which invented or legitimated um, diagnostically um, post-traumatic stress disorder and with this what you get is the ability for you get the transformation I should say of people who have committed um, atrocities including rape and mass murder suddenly becoming less aggressors and more victims or casualties of war in themselves they are ill because of what they did and they need to be cured um, for this so this trauma trope if you like collapses acts into responsibilities, acts of violence become indistinguishable from responses to violence. And the suffering body, if you like, sort of um, disappears under the weight of these individual um, perpetrator um, psyches. And this, of course, is what made PTSD so important for the um, defense in the um, um, International Criminal Tribunal for the f former Yugoslavia. The defense used PTSD to exonerate um, mass murderers and rapists. After all, they only did it because um, they had been traumatized by events, so they were exonerated. But it also, of course, um, discredited uh, victims themselves because, of course, victims, of course, were also traumatized. And so, Trauma memories are notoriously unreliable, so they could also be dismissed. So it was a very interesting use of this trauma trope. And what you get, I mean, I'm not denying, of course, that perpetrators or some perpetrators can be traumatized. My point is much simpler, and that is that trauma itself is not uh, redemptive. Um, why are you doing this to me? Sometimes when we look into the past, all we have, or when we look into violence generally, all we have is this violence of rhetoric. But I'd like to suggest that it can be pinned down, it can be uh, exposed for being historically contingent and unstable. Why are you doing this to me? The rape victim asks, insisting on historical specificities as opposed to ahistorical, trans um, historical, um, um, trans, uh, psychological, and um, um, sociological explanations. Terror is always local. To universalize it is to strip that individual of her own experiences. And what I'd just like to suggest is that it is by looking at these specificities of violence that we actually can at least take a few steps towards not only imagining a world without violence, but also attempting to create a world that is um, outside uh, sexual and other forms of violence. Thank you.